Good evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about the secrets of Lazarus. Your Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among so many, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I want to thank Mark Anthony, but he's not here for his vision. <laughs> Uh, he actually pestered me for three months to give a session for Len. So of course, since then I've been trying to avoid him, don't reply emails. <laughs> but then, yeah. one day I was in near my mom's house, so he tracked me down with his motorbike, you know. <laughs> he said, no more excuse, two weeks time. I said, okay, okay. So, Mark Anthony is a good manager. That's right. Mm. Uh, so thanks for all the BC leaders for promoting it as well. So I think it's good uh, to spend time together. I've been thinking a lot about uh, the story of Mary and Martha. Like, uh, Martha was the one always running around, doing a lot of ministries, doing things for Christ. But the, the youngest sister, Mary, was the one who chose the better part, right? <coughs> she spent time with the with Lord and uh, on His Word. So I think that's what we're going to try and do tonight. So tonight, we're going to talk about the dying and the raising of Lazarus. Uh, it's like a sequel, the part two, if you like. Now, we're, we're going to go home with two things tonight for you. The first thing is, we're going to talk about how does this miracle, how does this account, fit into the overall structure of the Gospel of John. Not the book, the Gospel of John, but the Apostle John's perspective on the good news. How does our Apostle John see Christ and the salvation work of Christ? You see, in his perspective, in John's Gospel, Jesus performed seven miracles or seven signs. And the raising of Lazarus was the last sign that he performed before he entered into Jerusalem for the last time to face his passion. So in John's head, there's a connection between Lazarus and Jesus. As Lazarus died and he rose again, just like Christ, he, his death and his resurrection. So he, the connection is very strong from his perspective. And after all, uh, the raising of Lazarus, you can only find it in the Gospel of John. So there's a very Johannian flavor to it, if you look carefully, all right? So that's number one. The second thing we're going to bring home tonight is the secrets of Lazarus. And the secret of Lazarus is this. Uh, tell you up front. The, it's about Lazarus, his life, his suffering, his death, and his rising again is actually a fulfillment of a prediction or a prophecy by our Lord himself at a different time, in a different gospel. And because he fulfilled that prophecy, that's what sealed his own death warrant. That's what sealed his own fate. That's why he died on the cross. That's what contributed to him going to the cross. He literally laid down his life for his friend, the one whom he loved. So tonight we're going to see uh, why is that the case here. If you can get that, I think this land, this Easter, will have a deeper meaning for you and when you look at the cross. Okay? So I can't wait. So let's go to your Bibles. John chapter 11. Take your time, it's okay. Uh, I did it. <laughs> yeah, you marked it already. You're cheating. <laughs> found it. Okay, found it. Go to verse 45 once you get there. <laughs> okay, verse 45 okay so verse 45 onwards in John 11 is like the sequel the part 2 if you like of the raising of Lazarus now the part 1 we're all quite familiar with right from verse 1 to verse 44 but let me tell you what happened, just uh, to refresh your memory a bit. So John described a man who was sick. His name was Lazarus. And he had two sisters, Mary and her sister Martha. So when Lazarus fell ill, they sent an SOS to Jesus. He said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So Jesus, he heard that message, and instead of going there immediately, he stayed for two more days where he was, in a town called Perea. So 
those two days delay cost Lazarus his life. It proved to be a fatal decision. Because when, La- when Jesus eventually got there at Bethany, they found out that Lazarus was already dead for four days. It's too late. For the Jews, if a person has died for four days, it means his soul has left the body permanently. And it's gone to a place called Sheol or Hades. All right? And this separation between the body and soul is going to be permanent until the day of the resurrection. So four days means this guy is dead. This, this corpse has no more soul. You can't do anything for him anymore. All right? so, but it wasn't a hindrance to Jesus, as we all know. He went to the tomb of Lazarus. He cried there. And he said three things to the crowd there and to the tomb. He said, remove the stone. Lazarus come out and unbind him and let him go. And next thing that we know, Lazarus popped out and walking around like a, like a mummy, right? So that's how part one finished, verse 44. So verse 45 is the continuation of that story, okay? So can somebody read? Because of what Christ has done, i.e. this miracle, the Pharisees and the scribes, they call for a meeting, a business meeting, because they were facing a big problem, apparently. And what was the big problem? They said, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Right? So for them, this was a big problem because if we let Jesus unleash on the streets, if it goes on like this, if it goes on proclaiming the kingdom of God on earth, it's going to be a problem because then he is going to change the face of the earth. He is going to rock our world and we don't like it. So they saw the future of where this was going and they wanted to stop it. Okay? Now what happened next? Verse 49. So in my line, it says, on that day on, they plan to put him to death. Now, if you look at the text there, let, let's recall a little bit. Who is the one who pushed through the agenda that Jesus had to be put to death? The text itself, who does it say that? Who says that? Caiaphas, all right? Why? Why did he have the idea, the concept, that he had to put him to death, to kill Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die from that text there? Because what? Hmm? He prophesied it. He prophesied it. Mm. His, his position as high priest is at stake. It's at stake. Okay, why? Because um, if he does that, he feels that the people will follow him more than he, and that his position as a high priest in the temple will be diminished. Mm. And in that, he is also making a lot of money to be a <coughs> Correct. So his power will be eroded if they follow Christ. All right. Okay, very good. Okay, what else? So it's a power struggle thing. Okay. It's okay. Have a seat. All right. So the power struggle came into play. Okay, what else? Okay, from a text there, what else is there? It's true, huh? Okay. What else? Because what? Okay, what does it say there? All right. Now, look carefully there. First of all, if you look at the text there, it seems that he was con- they were concerned because of the, on account of the miracle itself. All right? They wanted to kill, kill Christ because of the miracle, because he raised Lazarus back from the dead, and people were following him. But if you think about it, it doesn't seem to make sense. Because Jesus, he had did this before. Jesus had an excellent track record of raising the dead before this miracle. Right, in Mark chapter 5, he raised up the daughter of Jairus. Right, in Luke chapter 7, he raised up the son of the widower in a place called Nain. So in those instances, when he raised them back from the dead, it, it, it caused a big sensation as well. But it didn't lead to the Pharisees and the scribes to get together and say, let's go and kill Christ. It didn't lead to that kind of reaction among the authorities. Right, so it cannot be possibly because of the miracle itself. Now the text itself says that or is it because of the Romans are going to come and to destroy our nation? And that was his main argument. That one day the Romans are going to come and destroy our temple and that will be the end of us. That was his argument to push through that why they had to kill him. But it doesn't make sense also. Because if you look at it carefully, at this point of Jesus' ministry, Pontius Pilate 
the, the Roman representative in Jerusalem, they were not afraid of Jesus at all. Whatever Jesus did, it didn't cause a sensation back in Rome. In fact, on Good Friday, when Christ was brought to Pilate, he didn't even know who he was. All right, so whatever Jesus was doing for his people, only, correct, it's only among the Jews. It didn't, it, it's not going to lead to the Romans going to come and destroy the whole nation. Right, it seems like a very unfounded fear. Moreover, at this point of Jesus' ministry, in John chapter 11, from John's perspective, Jesus' power and his influence was already on the wane. Jesus was already on the way down in terms of his uh, members and his followers. Now, why is that the case here? Now, who can tell me what was the peak point of Jesus' ministry in terms of numbers? The most amount of people that followed Jesus in all the four Gospels was what number? 5,000, 5, correct. And where, where did we see that? Correct, correct. In John's Gospel, he put it in John chapter 6, right, where 5,000 people came to see Jesus. Now, from a political perspective, that's when you should be the most afraid. Because what did he do there? He multiplied five loaves and two fishes and he fed 5,000 people. Now, in the mind of the Jews, this is very significant because if you look at it from a political perspective, this means what? It means the problem of food is now solved already. Right? We can raise an army if we want. We can go against the Romans. Even if, we, even if they cut off our food supplies, this guy right here, he's the Messiah. He can give us all the food that we need. Okay? And if he can do this with food, I'm sure he can do that with the weapons as well. He can multiply guns, like the hand grenades and everything. So there's a chance here. Right? So if you want to be worried about the, the uprising of Rome, that would be the time where you'd be the most afraid. But that peak didn't last long though. Right? That high didn't last long because the very next day, Jesus screwed it all up by teaching them what? The, the teaching on the Eucharist. The next day, when the crowd came back to him again, he said, he told them about the bread of life. And he told them that he had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, otherwise you have no life within you. And that's what the Jews backed off. And they found it very uh, repulsive. And in John's Gospel, in John chapter 6, verse 66, the 666 uh, verse, he said, John remembered, he said, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. The people who turned back were not just the 5,000. Even the 12 was rocked by that uh, teaching. Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Uh, he was willing to sacrifice his popularity in terms of defending truth. He was not going to dilute truth for the sake of being popular or getting members. That was not the point here. And that was the teaching, John chapter 6, that Judas Iscariot decided to betray him. All right? it was a, so it was at the teaching of the Eucharist that made Ju uh, Judas uh, fall apart. Okay, but the point is, at this point, Jesus' popularity was already going down. He had no longer a huge following. Maybe he had a few here and there, but not as great as before. So Caiaphas' fear of him having an army is unfounded. All right? But the plot thickens though. It gets even more interesting about why, where is this fear coming from. If you go to the next chapter, John chapter 12, verse 9. John recalls, When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, Lazarus, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Now, this is very strange. First, they want to kill Jesus, and now they want to kill Lazarus as well. Right? <laughs> it doesn't seem to make sense. This is very, very off. This miracle is very different from all the other miracles. See, it's one thing to kill Jesus, we can somehow make an argument for that, but why Lazarus? Why the man who was healed? What, what did he do here? Now, if you say that, well, it's because of him, of his testimony, that's why people were believing in Jesus, that's why he deserved to be killed, then if you follow that argument, then you also have to kill the daughter of Jairus, you also have to kill the, the son of the widower in Nain, you must kill the man with, uh, who was possessed with demons, who went about to proclaim about Jesus, you must talk about the man who was paralyzed, who was healed, the blind man who was healed, who went out to proclaim Christ, you must go and kill all of them as well. But when, they, when these people, when they're going out to, pro to, to proclaim, 
their life was not in danger. But Lazarus, what did he do? He came back from, from the dead, and now they want to kill him. There's something odd here about this miracle that we seem to be missing. Right? His testimony was very unique. Whatever his testimony was, it provoked. When, when the chief priests heard it, when they went there to see him, they said, we have to kill him as well. All right? Now, what was that testimony, though? But before we go into that, let's look at that line here. It says, it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Okay, this is huge here. That means many of the Jews, they were willing to turn away from the Pharisees, to turn away from the, the established religious authorities and to follow Christ. Okay, they were basically saying goodbye to Judaism and they were believing that Christ was the Son of God based on this miracle, based on what Lazarus said. Now, what did Lazarus say? They convinced them to give, live behind their old lives. And they were Jews. They were not like uh, changed to another religion. They were just living behind their religious uh, beliefs. Now, at this point, that's when John changes gears and it goes to the next verse, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the fe festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to see, meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So this was the Feast of uh, Palm Sunday. So in John's head, the dying and the raising of Lazarus is very closely connected to his passion, the death and the resurrection of Christ, all right? Holy Week. But what's the connection here? Now, so it all comes down to how to solve this mystery. Why did they want to kill Jesus and Lazarus? Now, the hypothesis is this, that this miracle is more than meets the eye. There's much more that we have seemed to have missed out. The plot to kill Jesus is not just about because he raised a dead man back to life, but what it meant to the Pharisees. How did they interpret this miracle in their own head? All right? So this is where we go into the secrets of Lazarus. What did he go through and what did he say? And why did Jesus raise him up again? All right? So as I said just now, the secret of Lazarus is about the fact that Jesus, he has made a prophecy about this incident, about the life, the suffering, and the rising again of Lazarus, in another time, in a different gospel. And when that prophecy was fulfilled much later on in John chapter 11, maybe years later, it was like dropping a bombshell into the heart of Jerusalem. And it shocked the Pharisees to such a degree that they overreacted. I'm going to kill Lazarus, I'm going to kill Jesus. I'm going to wipe them all out. And eventually they did it. They killed Christ. Okay? Now, but how do we go about this? Now, John gives a clue here in John 12, verse 10, where he says, So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death. Chief priests, singular or plural? Plural. Okay, take your notes. Okay, okay let's, let me ask you a pop quiz first. Huh? Now, I, say, I said that the bombshell was that Jesus made a prophecy at a different time in a different gospel. Okay? Now, think about this. Where in the other three gospels that Jesus talked about this incident, the raising of Lazarus. Matthew, Matthew where? If I say it, you'll know. But then you'll be like, ah, oh, like that. Okay, I guarantee, okay? It's not in your notes, lah. of course, I won't give you the notes, lah. okay? <laughs> okay? No, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Now, as I said, the clue here is the, the term chief priest, plural. Go to the first uh, paragraph that I gave you, Luke chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 2. Okay, I give you the notes just to, for you to easy to read instead of going through your Bible. Okay, now who can read verse 1 in the notes? Uh, don't worry about that. Okay, verse 2. Go to the verse 2. During? During the high priest with Apenas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Aha. Uh -huh. Alright, so Luke, as you know, he's a historian of the church. 
He writes things in historical detail. So it, from his re, uh, recording, the time of Jesus was well, there were two high priests reigning in the Sanhedrin. Okay, do you follow that? The two high priests were who? Annas and Caiaphas. All right, the one who plotted to kill Jesus just now. Okay, now why would there be two high priests? It doesn't seem to make sense. It seems to it should only be one, right? Why two? Ah, sort of. The original high priest was actually Annas. Annas, he openly resisted Rome. Rome didn't like Annas at the time. So they replaced Annas <coughs> and they raised up Caiaphas. So Caiaphas was the one who deals directly with Pilate, with Rome. And this is not just some historical background. We see this play out at the Passion Play as well. The night that Christ was arrested, the soldiers brought him to Annas first to be tried. After Annas tried him, they brought him to Caiaphas. After Caiaphas convicted him, they threw him into jail. The next day, Caiaphas brought him to Pilate. Okay, there's a hierarchy there. All right, so there were two high priests at the time. But Annas, he continued to remain his influence in the Sanhedrin. Okay, the Jews still followed him, but they had two high priests. They recognized two high priests. Now, with that in mind, go to your Gospels, Luke chapter 16. One finger in John, huh? One finger in John. We're going to come back to John. Okay. One finger in John. Luke chapter 16. As you go to 16, we go to verse 13. Luke 16, verse 13. <coughs> okay, I'll take a shot here. Now, this is Jesus speaking here. Okay? He's speaking to the Pharisees. No slave can serve two masters. For the slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Verse 14. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. Okay? End quote. So what's going on here? Luke chapter 16 is actually coming on the tail end of the parable of the prodigal son. The session that we shared last time when we were together. Now, what happened in Luke chapter 15? And why is he responding in this way? Now, you may recall in Luke chapter 15, Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees. The Pharisees accused Jesus of what? Spending time with sinners and eating with them. And he was in communion with the sinners. So Jesus responded by defending himself, by giving not one, not two, but three parables in the row, ending with the parable of the prodigal son, to explain to them why does he do what he do? Why does he spend time with sinners? And the reason was, in his perspective, is because our Heavenly Father, He welcomes His children when they are lost, when they come back to Him. My son was dead, and he has been brought back to life. Okay? Dead man coming back to life. Huh? Now, after defending himself, he goes on the offensive on the Pharisees in Luke chapter 16. He goes on the attack on the Pharisees. He said, you thought what I did was a scandal to you when I spent time with sinners. But let me school you a little bit about what's a real scandal here. The scandal is this. You are worshipping a false god. How's that for a scandal? You are worshipping money. God is your, money is your god. And, you cannot, and I tell you this, you cannot serve God and money at the same time. You cannot serve two masters. What you are doing is an abomination in the sight of God. So he was going against the Pharisees here. Now, and he drove home this point about how far off they are, they are from God in a story in verse 19. Okay? Now, Luke 16, verse 19, somebody read, Behold the bombshell. Huh? <coughs> Once there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and feasted every day. At his gate lay 
Lazarus, a poor man covered in salt, who longed to eat just the scraps falling from the rich man's table. Dogs used to come and lick his salt. Finally, the poor man died, and angels carried him to take his place with Abraham. The rich man followed shortly and was buried. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Who was mentioned there? Stranger, huh? Now, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking here. Now, before you think, oh, this is, this is another, another parable, another fable, it's impossible. This is not a parable here. This is where people made a mistake. <coughs> In all the parables of Jesus, all four Gospels, all the parables does not have a name. A certain man, a certain woman, and things like that. But this one, names are given. Lazarus was mentioned. Later on, Abraham was mentioned. Okay, this is something real here. He's making a prophecy. The first character in this prophecy was a man who was rich. Now, this man, Luke gives us a lot of details, typically of Luke. We know he is, he is rich, we know he is male, and we know from his dressing, he is dressed in purple with fine linen, high quality clothes. We also know that he feeds sumptuously or he lives luxuriously. And later on in verse 28 or 29, Jesus tells us that they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, this man, he has the law. He has the Torah in his hand. Now, who is this man? Huh? Okay, who? Who is this man? Who fits all these descriptions? Rich? He's a man? He, hmm? The rich man. The rich man, yes. But who is this rich man? Huh? Who? Who? Pharisee, okay, which Pharisee? I see the high priest. Good, good job. How do you know it? How do you know? Uh huh. But the Pharisee would have it. Now, what gives it away is the dressing. Okay, very good. Well, I never saw this coming, okay? The dressing. He's dressed in purple with rich linen. If you go back to the Old Testament, in Exodus 28, verse 8, you can go back and read. It's a description of the vestment of the high priest purple clothes with thick quality linen. Okay? The, the first high priest was Aaron. That was his, his dressing. And after that, all the high priests must, must dress in that way. The high priest continued this tradition. Now, don't get me wrong here. So there's no mistake in here. If you go to Jerusalem and say, show me a man who is rich, dressed in purple clothes with fine linen, he knows the law and lives luxuriously every day, who is this man? They'll say, go to look, look for the high priest. Okay, no mistake in here. Jesus cannot say his name directly. Okay, so he went about the other way. But everybody there, all the Pharisees who were listening to this accusation, knew exactly who, who he was talking about. All right? First character is the high priest. The second character, and his gate, the rich man, the, the, the high priest gate, lay a man who was poor. In mine, was a, a poor man. How about your translation? Anybody else? Uh, Lazarus, who was what? I think yours minus. Who was what? Poor man. Poor man. Beggar. Okay. Nothing. Uh, actually, it's all wrong. The, the Greek for poor is actually, it's a, it's a different word. Jesus was mentioning the poor as in helpless. A helpless man. He cannot help himself. He needed help. And he gave us his name. Lazarus. Of all the names, Lazarus. Now, Lazarus has a meaning behind that name. Lazarus means... God who is my help. Right? God who is my help. And the, the Hebrew origin of, that, of Lazarus, the, how, the, how the Hebrew speak is Eliza. Okay? Lazarus is a Greek. So Eliza means God who is my help. The name Eliza comes from the Old Testament as well. Eliza was the son of Aaron, the high priest. So in the Old Testament, the high priest Aaron had a son. His name was Lazarus. In Jesus' mind, in the New Testament, there's also a high priest. He also had a spiritual son called Lazarus as well. The father's, son, the father's job is to take care of the son, right? Physically and spiritually. That's the job of the priest. That's the job of a spiritual father towards his children. But how did this spiritual father fare? Now, but there's more description about this Lazarus character. He said he was covered with what? Sores. Now what are sores? It means he's suffering from what? 
in Jewish language means he was he was a what? <laughs> Leper, correct. Maybe it's herpes, maybe it's Hansen disease, right? But whatever it is back then, if you got some sores on your skin, whatever degree it is, curable or uncurable, you are declared to be a leper in the eyes of the law of Moses. If you know the law and the, and the prophets, you're a leper. Now, if your leper means you're what? You are cut off, what else? You are unclean, right? Everywhere that you go, if you're still allowed to walk around, you must cover your mouth and say, unclean, unclean, so that people will walk away from you. Right? So he was rejected. And there are a few things that you cannot do as well. Another thing is you cannot go home. Right? The law says you must go and live out. You cannot live in your own camp. You must live somewhere else. You cannot pass on this gene to the next generation. Outcast. Outcast. And you definitely cannot go to the temple. Maybe the outer courts, but not the inner courts. And you definitely cannot go near the high priest. Maybe you can, but you definitely cannot do what you're trying to do here. To eat from, a, from his table. You cannot be in communion with him. You cannot go to his house and eat together with him. It's never going to happen. All right? Which is what, what he's trying to do here. To eat from his table. Okay? Now, what does he want here? He said he wanted some... He was hungry. Looking for food. Some crumbs. Now, there's a parallel story here between Luke 16, the story of Lazarus, and another real-life story between Jesus and a Canaanite woman in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 15. Now, the story goes, I'm sure you all know, there was a woman from Cana, they came to Jesus. She said, Jesus, my daughter is ill. She is suffering from demons. She's possessed, possessed by devils. And Jesus looked at her and he said, but I only came to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman said to him, Lord, please help me. Jesus thought about it and he said, and he said yeah, but it's not fair for me to take the food that is meant for the children and give it to the dogs. Right? Remember that one? And very, very not, not very nice, right? Very unkind. Okay? Now, how did the woman respond? She didn't give up. She said, yeah, it's true. What you say is true, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs that come from the master's table. Okay? So Jesus was, he said, well done, woman. Okay? Your faith has made your daughter well. Go ahead. Okay. So the daughter was healed because of her faith. So in that story, both Jesus and the woman, when they talk about food from a master's table, they were not talking about actual food. Right? What were we talking about? Talking about what? They were looking for? for? For healing, right? I want healing. I want mercy. I want some grace. I, want, I need a miracle. Right? But not actual food. So that's what Lazarus was looking for. Maybe he was hungry, but he was looking for the medicine of mercy. He wanted a healing from the high priest, the one that is supposed to be his spiritual father. Maybe he wanted some consolation. Maybe he was looking for a concession, maybe, to go home, the permit to go home, to see his family. Maybe he had some permission to show that he's getting better so he can look for work again. Something like that. We're not sure. Some kind of healing touch from his father. But he, his request was not denied. He was simply ignored by this rich man. Things got so bad that the sores become to get worse and the dogs came to lick his wounds. That means he was very weak, physically and spiritually. He was so weak that even the dogs come, he cannot even run away. Lick me, lick me, that's it. He was dying already. His sores was killing him, physically and spiritually. He was giving up hope. Things got so bad that he eventually died. But something happened here. Now, let me ask you a quiz here. Who is this Lazarus character? In Luke chapter 16. Who is him, actually? We are so close. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Go back to John chapter 12. Okay, I'll review this mystery for you. So you okay, never mind, never mind. It's okay, okay. Maybe. All right. Okay, one finger on 12. One, on John, one finger in Luke, okay? John chapter 12, verse 1. Yeah, okay. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There, they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, as usual. And Lazarus was the one at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nut, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? You know that story, right? Okay, no problem there. Now, 
So we all know what happened was after Jesus raised from the dead, they had a dinner together. That's what John 12 was describing. Now go to your notes there. Okay. Parallel story. The second uh, paragraph, Matthew 26, verse 6 to verse 9. The anointing at Bethany. Now while Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, hmm, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Is this the same story in John chapter 12? Yes or no? Yes or yes? Yes. 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 But what's the difference? Hmm? Simon the leper, correct. Where was this taking place? At Bethany. We all agree it's at Bethany, okay? Whose house? Ah. What's going on here? In John 12, it's Lazarus' house. In Matthew's version, it's Simon the leper's house. Has a coin dropped yet? How do you... Huh? Come again? Correct. Correct. In John? Correct. Simon the leper is Lazarus of Bethany. The same person. Simon is Lazarus. Right? Maybe his name was Simon Lazarus. <coughs> or maybe Jesus changed his name from Simon to Lazarus uh, to reflect the connection between Aaron and Lazarus in the Old Testament and how the priest should treat him in the New. We're not sure. But it is the same person. Okay? So what happened was, Lazarus of Bethany, he was a leper. That was his illness. He travelled from Bethany to Jerusalem one day, which according to John 11, is only two miles apart. He travelled there one day to want to see the, the high priest, the rich man. But he was denied entry. Maybe he was looking for the permission to go home. Maybe he was showing proof that he was getting better. But he was ignored. He didn't receive any mercy, any attention from the high priest, his spiritual father. Things got so bad, but he persisted there. But things got so bad, he was hungry, and eventually he was dying. Before he died, something happened. The news broke out, and Mary and Martha heard about his struggles. And they made arrangements to bring Lazarus home, to back to Bethany. And that's where you see John's Gospel begin to make sense. In John chapter 11, verse 1, that's when the account, uh, the story of Lazarus begins. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. When they brought him home, they immediately called for Jesus for help. The high priest won't help him. Maybe Jesus will help him. All right? But Jesus heard the news. When he heard the news, he knew the prophecy was about to be fulfilled. The hour has come for the death and the resurrection of not just Lazarus, but himself as well. He purposefully waited for two more days where he was, at Perea. Those two days must have been so agonizing for him. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go and save him. But he waited because he knew that was not God's will. When he eventually got there, Lazarus was already dead for four days because of, he, was, he died of leprosy, basically. And if this illness could have been healed if only the high priest had lifted his finger. Eventually, he went to the tomb and he began to cry. He cried at the tomb of Lazarus. He said, this shouldn't have happened. But he raised him back from the dead. All right? So this was the background story of Lazarus. All right? The death could have been prevented. But Jesus allowed it to happen to reveal to the disciples who he was, the Son of God. Now, after he raised him back from the dead, Lazarus, he didn't just come back from death to life, but he was also healed completely. Right? He, had no more, he was no longer a leper. He was able to dine with them, to eat with them. And you can see later on, the Pharisees, the great crowd, came to press upon him. Even the Pharisees and the scribes came to see him as well. Okay? So he was healed already at this point. 
and he was bearing testimony about what happened. So last time he was a leper, now he is healed. So that's a very powerful testimony. Okay, so whatever he said was a very, yes, very convincing. All right. So what did he say to them? Now, go back to Luke chapter 16, verse 23. <coughs> All right, let's continue the story. So at this point, everybody in Bethany knew there was a leper called Simon, Simon Lazarus. He was not a famous man, not yet. Now, when Lazarus eventually died, all, when all this was going on, when the four days was in a tomb, something happened there. In verse 23, what happened? Can somebody read? Okay, thank you. So here we see the situation reverse between Lazarus and the high priest. Now, the high priest, in his mind, he shouldn't, he shouldn't be there. See, for the Jews, they say, if I'm a high priest, if I have the law, if I'm a prophet, if I serve God in a temple, if I'm, a, if I'm rich and powerful, that means God has blessed me. Right? If I die, I should go to the bosom of Abraham. Right? This joker right there, this poor leper, the poor, the sick, the, uh, those who are rejected, the outcasts, they should be burning in hell. They should be in agony in these flames. But he was surprised that, hey, the situation is reversed. And he didn't see this coming at all. all right? so, and not only that, in verse 25 onwards, things got even worse for him. Le Abraham said to him, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. So this is not just where he was at that moment. <coughs> this thing is fixed. It's not going to change. This situation is going to be permanent. And what did I do to deserve this? All right? He's stuck there now. Right? Now, how did he respond to this agony? In verse 27, he says this. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him, Lazarus, uh -huh, to my father's house. Send Lazarus back, he said. Why? That he may warn them. The words that came out of Lazarus' mouth was a warning. So that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father, Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, he said, Go back to my father's house. Now, who was his father? And he said he had five other brothers. Who were these brothers? Okay, who was the rich man referring to? Okay, now, go back to John here. Okay, John... 18. Wait, wait, wait. I think you, I get in your notes, your notes, sorry. In your notes, John 18, verse 12 to 14. All right. Who, are he, who, who was his father and the five brothers? Jesus before the high priest. He says, so the soldiers, this is a uh, Good Friday, a uh, Holy Thursday. Huh? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Anus. Who was the? father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Ah, now it makes sense. So in, with that logic, who was the one that he saw tormented in fire? If the father was Annas, the high priest, his father-in-law, so who was in, in hell? Caiaphas was the one in hell. That's what, that's what Lazarus saw. It makes sense, right? Now, who were the five brothers? Go to your next page of your notes. Now, to this, to, to uncover and solve this mystery, we need to borrow from the historian Josephus. Now, Josephus was a historian who lived during the time of the apostles. And he recorded the Jewish history during that time, right up to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. 
Now, Josephus recorded this. Now, the report goes that this elder, Annas, proved the most fortunate man, for he had five sons who had all performed the office of a high priest to God. And he had himself enjoyed that dignity a long time formerly, which had never happened to any other of our high priests. Right, so this is a, a family of high priests here. And he listed the five sons in his book, even the years where they served. All right, whatever years they were. The last one, Annas the younger or Annas the less, he ruled as a high priest up to 62 AD. Now, if you know your history, the temple was destroyed at 70 AD by the Romans. So they ruled, they ruled up to the point where the temple and Jerusalem was effectively destroyed permanently. All right? So the Talmud also described this family of Annas and Caiaphas in your notes there. It says, Woe to the house of Annas. Woe to their serpent's hiss. They are high priests. Their sons are keepers of the treasury. Their sons-in-laws are guardians of the temple. And their servants beat people with staves. Right? Not a very complimentary uh, description of this family. All right? so, which fits well with what Jesus said about them. Okay? Now, so what happened? So in verse 31, okay, wait on. Okay. So eventually he said, he said to them in Luke 16, uh, 16, he said, If you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Right? So who was the one who came back from the dead to warn them? Lazarus came back from the dead. Right, so when Jesus raised Lazarus back from the dead and the news broke out from Bethany and the news eventually reached Jerusalem where Caiaphas was. And Caiaphas, remember, he heard this, this prophecy a few years ago about this, this prediction and the pieces began to make sense. The news came to him, hey, Caiaphas, this Jesus guy, he did another miracle. He said, what do you do now? He raised a leper back from the dead. He said, huh, okay, okay. Please don't tell me his name is Lazarus, <laughs> right? Yes, it's Lazarus. Oh, man, right? Bombshell, right? He convicted him, all right? This means that everybody now who heard that prophecy is going to believe in Jesus, all right? Jesus called out his corrupted priesthood, that he is the one burning in hell. And the sign for everyone to see was a dead man called Lazarus, a leper coming back from the dead, all right? An impossible prophecy that seems so difficult to fulfill but it was eventually fulfilled a few years later. All right? He did it. Jesus did it. Now, after that, <coughs> they began to plot to kill Jesus because what Jesus was effectively uh, saying to the Pharisees and the Jewish people was this. One, well, the day will come that even if I were to able to raise a dead man back to life, nobody, you, st you still wouldn't believe in who I am. All right? Even though I say that I'm a son of God, and I proved it with sign after sign, raising a dead man who has no soul, and I predict the name, the time, the place, in that if I do it effectively, you still won't believe that I'm the Son of God. All right? That's why you are so blind. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, that's why you will die in your sins, unless you believe that I am. Now, on the account of Lazarus, though, when the Jews came to press on Lazarus to see him that day, and asked him, hey, what it was like? What did you see there in those four days? Lazarus would have told them the truth. He said this, he would have said to the chief priest who was there at the audience, he said, I may be the one who was dead, but you are the one who is already in hell. Right? I went to you. I looked for mercy. I looked for help. I wanted some spiritual food, some crumbs from your table. And, I, and you didn't even give that to me. Right? And Jesus still came to you. He still wanted to save you. He came to you as the living water. The water that you can drink to cool your tongue so you can live again, and you still wouldn't have him. All right? So he was convicting them about the corruption of their priesthood. Right? Their corrupted priesthood was consuming Caiaphas and Annas, and it will be continuing until 62 AD. Now, the people of Israel will still have to suffer for another few years, at least for another generation. That was the a prophecy here that we know eventually was fulfilled. Okay? Now, what happened next? As you saw, Jesus was eventually arrested. So Caiaphas, his plan to, to his plot to kill Jesus eventually came to fruit. They brought him to Annas first. Eventually, they brought him to Caiaphas. 
On the day that he was arrested, Caiaphas asked Jesus in front of everybody, he said, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah, the Son of the living God? And Jesus said to him, I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming from the clouds of heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And at that moment, what did Caiaphas do? He tore off his vestment, right? And he said, blasphemy, right? What more evidence do we need? We should kill him, arrest him, or whatever. Now, when, you, when a person, when a Jew, tear off his vestments in a sign of uh, a blasphemy, is it allowed or not? Can you do that or not, technically speaking? Yes or no? Yes, actually you are allowed to do that, right? In a sign of, when somebody blasphemes against God, you are allowed to tear off your vestment as a sign of indignation. But not the high priest though. If he really had the Moses and the prophets on his side, he cannot do that. The law is very clear in the book of the, uh, the Levites. It says the, 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 the priesthood, uh, the, priesthood uh, the high priest's vestment must always be dressed. It can never be torn apart. If you do that, you're effectively giving up your priesthood. All right? you, are laying, you are throwing down your priesthood at the feet of Jesus. So Caiaphas gave up his priesthood by tearing off that vestment. He overplayed his hand there. All right? But nevertheless, what happened next? The next day, they brought him to Pilate and Jesus went to the cross. He stretched out his hands, he took the crown, he took the wounds, he shed his blood and he died. And when he died, what happened in the temple? To the curtains? Torn in two, right? And when the curtains were torn in two, Jesus became the high priest that Caiaphas can never be. Now why? Now, in history, they will record that the, the, the temple curtain was about 60 feet high from top to bottom. The thickness is about four inches thick. Right? And, and the, the thickness of the curtain and this big long curtain is to remind the Jews this separation between God and man, the Holy of Holies. This separation is sin, obviously. This separation is so real that only the high priest is allowed to go behind the curtain once a year on the Feast of Yom Kippur to offer up animal sacrifices, to atone for the sins of the nation. But the Jews knew that was not enough. They must do it year after year. It was not enough to atone for the nation, and it was not enough to atone for the sins of the world, that's for sure. But Jesus, by dying on the cross, that one off sacrifice was enough to remove the veil, to symbolically, to symbolically tell the Jews that this separation between God and man, i.e. sin, has now been removed. But in so doing, it also means the removal of the priesthood. The high priest will become redundant now because there is no longer for any need for the priest to offer up any sacrifices behind the curtains. All right, because of Christ, Jesus became the high priest. Now, that's why I want to close with Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, I'll just read to you. Verse 14, the author said this, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, and yet without sin. 